In this video from D3.1 on reproduction, we'll be focusing in on higher level content related to fertilization and pregnancy. We'll start with the mechanisms of fertilization, and what I want you to stay focused in on is that the plasma membrane of the sperm has to fuse with the plasma membrane of the egg, and we only want one sperm to fertilize the egg. So we want that fertilization process to occur, but we don't want many sperm fertilizing the egg, okay? So the first thing that's going to happen in order for the first sperm to fertilize the egg is something called the acrosome reaction. This is initiated by the sperm, and it has to do with the enzymes found in this uh, structure called the acrosome. This is going to weaken the zona pellucida and make it to where the sperm can more easily reach the cell membrane. So again, we want the cell membrane of the sperm to fuse with the cell membrane of the egg, so the sperm will use some of the enzymes in this acrosome to help get through some of these outer layers like the zona pellucida so that it can get to the plasma membrane of the egg. Once that occurs, no more sperm should be fertilizing the egg. So the egg is going to initiate a reaction called the cortical reaction. Remember, inside of the egg are these granules called cortical granules. Upon the fusion of the egg cell membrane and the sperm's cell membrane, the egg will release those cortical granules into the zona pellucida. Those cortical granules will do two things. One is that they will harden this zona pellucida. So imagine now the egg has like a hard shell on the outside preventing any sperm from entering. The other thing that that does, just in case there are already sperm in the zona pellucida, is that it is going to alter glycoproteins that sperm would use to attach to the egg cell membrane, and it alters them in a way so that no more attachment or penetration or fertilization can take place. Now, fertilization is going to take place usually in the oviduct, right? So that egg is released from the ovary, sperm comes up this way, and fertilization is going to take place in the oviduct. When we say fertilization, we mean fusion of the gametes to create a zygote. Once we have that single cell, once we have that zygote, it is going to rapidly undergo mitosis. So make a lot, a lot, a lot of copies. And we're gonna find that it increases in cell number, but not necessarily in size. And so you can see that progression here where it's dividing, 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 but that ball of cells remains the same size. It's just that each cell is smaller, okay? So after about six or seven days, we get this structure called the blastocyst cyst, and we'll outline that a little bit more detail on uh, in just a minute. While that's happening, this embryo has traveled from the oviduct to the uterus, okay? So all the while, while this cell division is occurring, we have seen um, a movement from the oviduct into the uterus. And at this point, all of those energy reserves that were present in that yolk, in that um, ovum, have been used up. And this developing embryo must uh, implant into the uterus in order to find nourishment. So this is now migrated to the uterus for implantation. So this is a very rough drawing of a blastocyst, right? So this is what we have after about seven days when that zygote has undergone mitosis a bunch and has migrated into the uterus. And we're going to find two distinct features here. So we have a ring of cells around the outside, and this is a structure called the trophoblast. And the trophoblast will eventually give rise to the placenta. Okay, so we'll come back to that part later. On the inside, we're going to notice this giant ball of cells. So here's the trophoblast. Um, this ball of cells is called the inner cell mass, and this is what will develop into the embryo or the fetus. So they, they develop into different parts. So at this point in the pregnancy, that uh, blastocyst is 
out of nutrients. It has to implant in the endometrial lining of the uterus. So that's that highly vascular lining. And if you remember from our previous discussions, um, that lining is maintained by the hormone progesterone. That progesterone is secreted by the corpus luteum. So in order for this pregnancy to remain, in order to prevent a miscarriage, we must continue the production of progesterone to maintain the endometrial lining. So the blastocyst or the embryo is going to secrete HCG, and that stands for human chorionic gonadotropin. It is very important that you know that it is the embryo that secretes that, and it maintains pregnancy early on by preventing degeneration of the corpus luteum. Remember, if no pregnancy occurs, the corpus luteum disintegrates, progesterone levels drop, and the endometrial lining is shed. We don't want that. Okay, so HCG maintains the corpus luteum to maintain high progesterone levels, to maintain a nice, thick, vascular, nourishing endometrium. Okay, now later on in pregnancy, we'll notice that HCG levels drop, and that is because the placenta will be well developed enough to produce its own progesterone. But early in pregnancy, progesterone levels are maintained due to the interaction between HCG and that corpus luteum. So here we're showing a pregnancy that is a little bit further along, right? So I have the uterus on the outside, here's the cervix, and here's obviously the developing fetus. It is attached via this umbilical cord to a structure called the placenta. And the placenta is the excite or the site of exchange between the mother and the fetus. So not only does it exchange material, but it also produces hormones like progesterone and estrogen. Having a placenta is an advantage um, in the fact that it can allow for longer pregnancies. And the longer that a pregnancy goes on, the more developed an offspring is when it is born. Some animals don't produce placentas. So for example, um, a kangaroo does, is a non-placental mammal. And if you'll notice when baby kangaroos are born, they're very small, they're very underdeveloped, and there are some obvious drawbacks to having babies very underdeveloped offspring. So the placenta is built by the uh, fetus and it looks a little bit something like this. So here's this is coming from the umbilical cord and it has structures that fan out like this. And those features are called villi. And just like villi in other parts of our body, they are shaped like that to increase the surface area for the diffusion of materials. It is very essential that you understand that fetal blood and maternal blood does not mix. Keep in mind that a fetus and a mother may have different blood types, so it's very important that those blood cells uh, don't actually mix. What's happening is that things from the mother's blood are diffusing through these villi into the fetal blood just based on the differences in solute concentration. So from the mother to the fetus, we're gonna see the movement of several important things. So oxygen is going to move from the mother into the fetal blood via regular diffusion. Glucose will move via um, a passive facilitated diffusion. We're also going to notice water moving in via osmosis and antibodies can be passed through the placenta that requires active transport in the form of endocytosis. Um, unfortunately, things like drugs or other toxins can also pass from the mother to the fetus through the placenta. Now, the fetus is also going to need to move waste products from its blood supply into the mother's blood supply. There's no way for the fetus to excrete things beyond just this um, womb, so it's important that it makes its way back into the mother's blood for excretion. 
This includes carbon dioxide, so that's going to move from the fetus to the mother via diffusion. Um, urea, which is a byproduct of protein digestion, will move from the fetus to the mother via endocytosis, or I should say it'll be exocytosis um, moving out of fetal cells um, and then endocytosis into the mother's cells. And then if any water exchange needs to take place, that will happen here. So the main points here are that fetal blood and maternal blood do not mix small dissolved mo molecules and other materials are diffusing in and out, and these villi are increasing the surface area for absorption, um, making that process more efficient. In addition to being a site of exchange, the placenta again produces hormones. Now remember, we need that endometrial lining to be maintained via the hormone progesterone. Early in pregnancy, that progesterone is coming from the corpus luteum, which is maintained by the HCG that is produced by the embryo. Once the placenta is developed enough, that progesterone is produced by the placenta along with estrogen um, or estradiol. So that's um, well enough to maintain that pregnancy and the HCG levels can drop. Another hormone that we'll be talking about is something called oxytocin. Oxytocin does a lot of things, and especially for those of you studying psychology, you're going to learn about some of the other effects. We will talk about oxytocin's effects strictly as they relate to pregnancy and childbirth. Oxytocin is a hormone that comes from the pituitary gland in the brain, and one of its functions is to cause uterine contractions. So remember the uterus is a muscle. It contracts to squeeze the baby out during childbirth. Well, we don't want that to happen until the end of pregnancy, which for humans is about at 40 weeks. Progesterone, in addition to maintaining the endometrium, also is an inhibitor for oxytocin production. So once progesterone circulates in the bloodstream and reaches the pituitary, it inhibits the production of oxytocin. At the very end of pregnancy, progesterone levels are going to drop. And when those progesterone levels drop, there's nothing inhibiting oxytocin. So oxytocin levels start to rise and initiate that childbirth process. Oxytocin will cause the uterus to contract. And when the uterus contracts, that is going to squeeze the baby and that head is going to push up against the cervix. That causes uh, even more oxytocin to be produced, which then causes even more intense and more frequent uterine contractions, which pushes the baby up against the cervix, which causes even more oxytocin to be produced, which causes even greater and more frequent uterine contractions, and so on and so forth. So this is why we say that oxytocin is in a positive feedback loop with the muscles in the uterine wall. It is one of the few examples of positive feedback loops that we'll talk about um, in these physiology sections. That will continue until the baby has exited during childbirth and actually will continue for a little while afterwards until the next stage of labor where the placenta is expelled as well. I hope that throughout this video you've come to realize the importance of hormones and their various um, functions in both fertilization and pregnancy and the menstrual cycle. During menopause, and this can happen at lots of different ages for different women, but we're generally thinking around 50 and later, hormone levels tend to drop. So we can see estrogen and progesterone levels um, throughout a woman's life in this menopause area or this menopause time um, marks a significant drop in those hormone levels. And this can cause all kinds of symptoms, hot flashes, changes to skin and hair, lots of different things. So many women choose to take HRT, which stands for hormone replacement therapy, and that is medication um, that includes estrogen and progesterone to supplement those hormone levels that are um, falling from naturally produced sources. 
there was initial data that suggested that hormone replacement therapy reduced the risk of coronary heart disease. So if I looked at like a scatter plot and I looked at the percentage of women taking hormone replacement therapy and the incidence of coronary heart disease, um, greater um, percentages of hormone replacement therapy were producing less um, incidences of coronary heart disease. And it was assumed that taking these hormones actually caused a decrease in the heart disease rates. But randomized controlled studies actually proved this to be quite the opposite, that there was a fallacy in thinking here. And so what was actually happening was that the women who were taking hormone replacement therapy were actually from um, higher socioeconomic classes and therefore had a lower risk of coronary heart disease for a variety of reasons. And so it it wasn't a completely representative sample. When these randomized and controlled studies took place, it actually showed an opposite trend. It actually showed that coronary heart disease um, was at increased rates with um, more usage of this um, hormone replacement therapy. So it's a great application of what we know about hormones and what we know about experimental design. So definitely something to look into there's some really interesting data analysis um, to be done there.